thank you everyone for uh, joining us. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to take this time to uh, uh, speak with you and, and to share uh, some interesting findings out of uh, uh, BioSerenity and our BioSerenity uh, EEG services. Uh, what I do want to share with you is uh, some very interesting findings that we've had um, as a result of a study that was done uh, in, uh, in France. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through um, the, uh, the nature of the problem um, and what we, we found and why we did EEGs and uh, what were some of the findings. And then I'll go through the significance of the findings and share with you a clinical correlation. And all of this, of course, is related to, uh, to COVID and the uh, pandemic as we first uh, earlier had seen it in, uh, uh, in Paris in the beginning of, of March. Um, and then I'll conclude with some recommendations. I, I do wanna offer a disclaimer. And as Janice had shared, uh, I am the chief medical officer and full-time employee of uh, BioSerenity. So what I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to uh, share with you briefly some of the interesting findings that we had uh, from our um, EEG services that we were performing in, uh, in Paris in ICUs during the uh, early weeks uh, in March. And this was during the early periods where we were starting to see an influx of patients being admitted to ICUs, uh, uh, presenting with... Uh, uh, COVID uh, symptoms, primarily respiratory symptoms, but was very interesting in, uh, in early in March. Uh, what we were finding uh, were uh, uh, various phenomena associated with uh, uh, neurologic compromise. And, and with that, we have an opportunity really to present some of the first and earliest EEGs that were obtained in patients uh, who were severely ill with, uh, uh, with COVID who presented to the ICU with some unusual uh, neurologic findings uh, that were not necessarily related to uh, any uh, respiratory phenomenon, or at least not early on. And one of the things that we've, we've recognized, and certainly this is in the, in the early days of the pandemic where we were first seeing it in France before other parts of the world, um, and certainly we learned a lot from uh, China, there's one thing that we, uh, we are recognizing, and that is the more that we learn about COVID, we learn that there is even more that we need to learn. And that is that there is still much to be discovered and much to be learned about, about COVID. But uh, as these patients were being admitted to the ICU, uh, we were seeing a cluster of older patients who were presenting with altered mental status, uh, cognitive changes uh, presenting upon admission. Uh, and these were uh, first thought to be associated with respiratory decompensation. But it was very interesting is that these patients did not present with the severe respiratory status that was typical of some of the earlier COVID patients. These were patients who were presenting with uh, confusion, uh, difficulty in arousability and, uh, and loss of consciousness. Uh, with um, uh, relatively, um, I would say, decent uh, O2 saturations. Not, not excellent, but they were certainly not in the, uh, in the levels that you would expect for severe respiratory compromise. Uh, as these patients were ad admitted to the ICU, uh, they were um, subjected to a course of diagnostic studies. And there was a cohort of about 26 uh, patients who um, were recognized as uh, presenting with uh, this uh, um, mental, uh, mental defect of, of altered, uh, altered consciousness, but also were presenting with difficulty in arousability, as I said. Um, what was also interesting is that uh, these EEGs were first ordered uh, to essentially rule out status epilepticus or non-epileptic seizures as, as part of the typical protocol that would be done in the ICU. Uh, now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to share some of the EEG findings. Um, first of all, of the 26 patients that had EEGs performed, uh, five of them demonstrated a, a very interesting and consistent pattern, uh, which uh, represented uh, periodic uh, delta, delta wave activity. And this was rather unique in these five patients. In the other 21, 
what we saw was generalized uh, slowing pattern uh, with, without any um, significant presence of uh, periodic uh, discharge. So we focused on those five patients and uh, we are sharing, uh, which has been published in the Annals of uh, Neurology, uh, the results of those uh, five patients. And what you can see in each of these is a, uh, is a pattern of generalized um, uh, slowing, primarily uh, a theta wave, but generalized slowing that one would say might be consistent with sedation. Now, of course, while these patients were in the ICU, uh, of the five patients, four were on ventilators, but they had been removed from uh, deep sedation and were attempted to be uh, awakened or aroused with great difficulty. Uh, the last patient, patient E, was a patient who was not on ventilator, was not, uh, of course, int intubated, and uh, persisted with um, a consistent uh, confused state. And in all of these, what you'll see is a, a pattern of generalized rhythmic uh, delta wave activities, high amplitude, uh, monomorphic and uh, biphasic. Uh, and these um, uh, delta waves uh, and this pattern of activities is found predominantly in the uh, frontal region. Uh, the majority of them are bilateral with the exception of patient C, which showed a more lateralized uh, uh, periodic discharge of delta wave activity in the, uh, in the right frontal lobe. So really what we noticed is that in these patients, um, uh, we saw that um, in general, uh, a generalized uh, rhythmic delta activity lasting uh, from two to four seconds uh, in, in interval, and one with a lateralized uh, periodic discharge. And uh, it seemed to suggest uh, some pattern of uh, of CNS or brain uh, injury or encephalopathy. Now, of course, the etiologies of these uh, can be nonspecific. Uh, the, uh, uh, the etiologies for the encephalopathy could be any, anywhere from uh, severe hypoxia or anoxia, uh, but also metabolic in nature, which may be renal uh, or, uh, or due to uh, uh, other uh, vascular or inflammatory or infectious processes. So clearly what we recognized is that in a pattern of patients who demonstrated uh, neurologic phenomena, particularly with uh, mental status changes and EEG evidence of a uh, generalized delta wave activity uh, in a repetitive fashion, uh, would seem to indicate that, that there was some potential pathology uh, occurring uh, in some portion of the brain, and in this case, the frontal area, um, suspecting that uh, it might in fact be related to, uh, to COVID as, as one of our hypotheses. Uh, now, one of the uh, phenomena that has been reported, and certainly early on in the studies that, that have been done out of China, and then subsequently early on in France, is that we recognize that uh, patients who were COVID positive were also presenting with other early neurologic findings, particularly uh, loss of sensation of smell and loss of sensation of taste, uh, frontal headaches uh, and uh, diffuse malaise and myalgia, uh, in addition to the typical respiratory symptoms. And we felt that there may be a pattern that's associated uh, not only with the loss of smell and the loss of taste, but the headache and of course the mental status changes. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take a few moments to share some of the uh, uh, consequences and correlations associated with uh, COVID-19 and the coronavirus uh, that may lend some support as to possible etiologies for uh, the uh, brain injury or encephalopathy, but might also explain some of the EEG patterns that we found in these five patients. And one of the things I, I'd like to bring to your attention is um, how uh, COVID virus, uh, how the coronavirus actually uh, can impact and infect the brain. And uh, a lot of the information, a lot of the uh, data that we've collected as far as the behavior of the coronavirus is, is really a result of earlier studies that have been done with some of the previous coronaviruses, and particularly with uh, SARS, MERS, and, uh, and some of the more typical uh, corona-type viruses, 
which all have a, uh, a neurologic uh, predilection. Uh, and that is that uh, what we know is that the uh, coronavirus has an affinity for uh, uh, angiotensive converting enzyme 2 receptors, the ACE2 receptors. We also know that the ACE2 receptors are found uh, certainly in the lungs, but also in the heart, the kidneys, blood vessels, and the brain. And we know that the virus has a tendency to strongly adhere to these receptors uh, in any of those organ systems. Now, the question might be, how does it enter the brain? Well, one of them may be through direct contact, and that is passage from the uh, uh, olfactory system, the olfactory bulb, uh, directly to the frontal lobe of the brain. Another may be through neurologic uh, transport and uh, transfer uh, through the vagus and the trigeminal nerves, knowing that uh, the virus actually does have a predilection for adherence uh, uh, to receptors, also found in uh, neural pathways. Then the, the third and uh, another significant way for uh, uh, contact uh, with the CNS system in the brain uh, is through hematogenous spread. So we know that when an individual becomes severely ill, particularly with a virus, and in this case with the coronavirus, uh, they develop a uh, viremia. And through this viremia, they are uh, exposing other organ systems to the virus. And in particular, causing an inflammation in the blood-brain barrier, uh, the virus is actually able to pass through the blood-brain barrier and uh, and seed uh, the cerebral vasculature and also portions of the brain. Um, in terms of the impact that the virus may have on, on the brain itself uh, and some of the neurologic consequences of the uh, coronavirus, um, I really break it down into two categories. Uh, one would be non-immunologic uh, causes of, uh, of neurologic uh, phenomenon, and the non-immunologic phenomenon uh, or the non-immunologic causes may be associated with hypotension. And we know, again, uh, the virus uh, causes uh, endothelial inflammation, and it also has an impact on autonomic responses, uh, both of which may result in uh, dilation of uh, arteries and, um, and a subsequent uh, uh, cause for hypotension. But also in uh, multi-organ system involvement, uh, we will see uh, uh, something similar to a sepsis syndrome, which may also cause hypotension. And it's that hypotension which may have an effect uh, indirectly on the brain. Also hypoxia, as, as we know, the, uh, uh, the virus has significant impact in the lungs, uh, has been uh, uh, significantly uh, uh, reported as a respiratory pathogen, which uh, results in uh, severe hypoxemia. And as a result, the hypoxemia may have uh, an impact and uh, a consequence on, uh, on the brain. And then third uh, is the uh, vascular um, impact that it has by causing uh, thrombosis, whether it be microthrombosis or uh, macrovascular thrombosis. And by doing so, causes clots in the cerebral uh, vasculature of the brain and subsequently causing uh, strokes or at the very least uh, uh, prolonged and persistent uh, transient ischemic attacks. So those are the non-immunologic uh, causes of potential CNS effects. Now, there are also a host of immunologic causes that uh, may have consequences on the brain. And one of them may be an adaptive cell-mediated and autoimmune process where it actually causes um, a, a direct autoimmune response on the brain. And in some of the EEG patterns that we saw, and in particular going back, looking at um, uh, the EEG pattern for patient uh, number five or E and patient uh, A, um, there is a pattern that might also uh, suggest uh, a, um, a subacute uh, sclerosis, uh, sclerosing panencephalitis, or something that you would uh, typically see with measles, which is an immunologic response to the measles virus. And there have been subsequent reports now of uh, EEG findings, but also clinical findings that suggest with the COVID virus, there may be a, a pattern that is very similar to uh, um, SSPE. 
Um, so that I think is a, is a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, also another immunologic response uh, could be associated with microglial activation. And that is that the microglia are, are activated by the virus and can cause uh, uh, focal damage and destruction to, to portions of the brain as well. And in this case, particularly in the frontal area. And then lastly, which is another phenomenon that is commonly seen with the COVID virus is the maladaptive cytokine storm. And this is where what we find is a cytokine release of tumor necrosis factor and other interleukins, which uh, cause uh, severe um, uh, inflammatory responses. And in this case, particularly in the brain, which can cause focal injury as well. So all of these could be potential consequences of the COVID virus that might explain uh, focal encephalopathy in the brain. Uh, and again, the EEG is strictly a tool that would suggest a potential signal of some process that may be occurring. And then finally, as we, as we look at the neurologic disorders that uh, are associated with uh, the COVID virus, uh, that particularly affect the central nervous system, as you can see, most of them are generally associated with uh, immunologic uh, or inflammatory uh, responses um, in the brain. And I think that's what we uh, are suspecting here, because in those five patients, uh, further diagnostics did not reveal presence of the virus in their cerebral spinal fluid. Um, there were increased levels of immunoglobulin found in, in one of the patients. And in, in another patient, an MRI actually showed a uh, hyperintensification uh, within the frontal lobe, uh, again, suggestive of, a, um, of an inflammatory process that might be taking place in, in that local region. If we look at the timeline for uh, neuropathies that could be associated with COVID, as you can see, they can begin as early as the first symptoms and signs of, of the virus. And in the case for the uh, patients that we studied in the Paris ICU, those were in fact some of the earliest uh, presentations uh, for uh, a handful of those patients, and particularly uh, the 26 patients that we performed EEGs on. Uh, these were patients where their earliest and first manifestations were actually confusional state, uh, uh, mental status changes, or loss of consciousness uh, in conjunction with uh, respiratory symptoms. And these occurred um, virtually at, uh, at day one. So in conclusion, as we look at the uh, EEGs that we found, and as we began to learn more, we saw subsequent reports uh, done by other centers where they similarly reported uh, EEGs showing generalized arrhythmic uh, delta activity in patients, primarily in the frontal lobe, uh, patients that presented with confusional states that had similar patterns, patients that were confirmed to have encephalitis or other forms of encephalopathy, again, with these uh, generalized delta wave activities in the frontal lobe. Now, I want to caution you is that these are not specific and they are not truly diagnostic, they are suggestive of, of a phenomenon that may take place that may suggest uh, local uh, or focal injury to the brain and are useful in conjunction with other diagnostic modalities, uh, such as lumbar punctures when they can be performed, uh, scanning if they can be performed. And we know in, in the case of COVID, um, MRI scans and CT scans are, are a rather complex procedure given a patient who is significantly uh, contagious. Uh, so infection control becomes an issue. So in this case, EEGs may in fact be suggestive of some, some process that is taking place. And with that, we, we would recommend that in patients who do present with mental status changes, who are COVID positive, who do have to be hospitalized, and there is no other explainable cause for the mental status changes, EEGs represent um, a useful um, tool in a host of other diagnostic modalities that need to be accomplished uh, to further study the patient. And again, I'm, I'm proud to have been a part of, uh, of, of this investigation, one, one of the first um, 
to actually uh, have reported these types of EEGs by our neurologic service uh, performed in, uh, in Paris. And as I've said, as we're learning more, we recognize that there is still more to be learned about COVID and its CNS consequences. So with that, I, I conclude and uh, thank you for your attention and uh, thank you for the opportunity to share this, uh, this interesting data. Thank you, Dr. Lavin. Uh, we do have uh, one question. Uh, are there any special requirements for technologists or physicians in caring for or testing uh, EEGs on COVID patients? I think that's a very good question. Thank you, Janice. Uh, I, I would say in, in terms of the, the skills, I would say that there is nothing unique or specific about the skills uh, required. It, it would be performed as a it's a typical EEG, and in this case, this was a, a typical routine EEG, but the precautions uh, are, are somewhat different. And in, in this case, it's, it's advised that disposable uh, electrodes, of course, be used. Uh, any equipment that can be disposed uh, after contact with the patient should be, but uh, careful and meticulous uh, desanitization and, uh, and sterilization is, is a must in, the, in these cases. And they need to be washed, wiped, and probably avoid using for a period of time uh, unless it can be completely um, uh, decontaminated and sterilized. Another thing that's important in terms of precautions is the use of uh, personal protective equipment, PPE. And in this case, certainly in a hospital, you, you should follow universal precautions. And that is assume any patient is potentially infected, particularly given the high rate of asymptomatic cases. And in, in these cases, gloves and masks are, are the norm in, uh, in, in the use by the technicians. And so I would say that uh, technologists, no special uh, skills or training other than precaution. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lavin. Sure. At this, at this time, we will turn it over to our second speaker, Dr. Benbedis. I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Janice. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Levin, and let me congratulate Dr. Levin on publishing that paper because, as I know from experience, publishing in Annals of Neurology is very difficult. It's a very picky journal, so it's not easy to get in there. Very nicely done. So I'm going to talk about uh, my favorite topic, which is the role of EEG for the diagnosis of epilepsy, and I'll go a little bit fast. I have a lot of things to present, but I always go fast. You all who know me know that. Um, these are my disclosures. I work for all kinds of EEG companies because diagnosing and treating epilepsy is what I do every day. What I'm going to present is lar largely based on two articles, which I'm happy to send you. This is one of them, and this is the other one that's published recently in the ILAE Educational Journal. Uh, if you want the full text of those articles, you can email me. That's why I put my email here, or you can email uh, Janice, and, and I will. she can forward me the requests. So here is what we're going to cover. I'm going to talk about some terminology first. Then I'll show a gazillion slides of EEGs in various types of epilepsies, and that goes fast, but you'll recognize patterns. And then I really want to discuss, which is relevant to bioserenity and and EEG in general, the role of various types of EEGs, long, short, with or without video, inpatient versus ambulatory. So let's go over some terms. As you all know, routine EEG is the oldest way we do EEG. It's a 20 minute recording, inexpensive, it's quick. By default, that's the EEG. Then came prolonged EEG where we make it last a little longer. That doesn't really have a good definition. Ambulatory EEG obviously means outside of the hospital in the outpatient setting. The problem often is that the term ambulatory EEG these days is used wrongly because it should be called ambulatory EEG video. Every EEG machine has a video. And one of my points tonight is to show you the value of the video during prolonged EEG recordings. EEG video monitoring is the term that I prefer because that says what it does. It monitors EEG and video. Now, as I will discuss in a few minutes, in the past and unfortunately still now, EEG video monitoring is often assumed to be an inpatient procedure, but it doesn't have to be. And I'll show you how that works. 
Long-term monitoring is a terrible term that I'm trying to ban all my people uh, in my center to use because it's confusing. It only refers to duration, long-term, but we don't know what long means, and it doesn't mention video, which is arguably the most important part of the test. Epilepsy monitoring and EG monitoring are general terms that are too nonspecific. So what I recommend, because these terms are vague, is to simply be descriptive. You want a three-day ambulatory EG video. That's clear cut. It has duration and it has what you want monitored. Another example, 24-hour ambulatory EG, no video. That's very clear. So instead of using vague terms, it's better to be specific and descriptive. These are two things I will not cover. Those are separate topics. We can do them another time, but intracranial EEG is an entirely different topic as is ICU EEG monitoring, which as you all know, has exploded and is done, overdone in my view often, but it's done in most uh, centers. So let's show some examples of typical EEGs of epilepsy. This is an easy one. This is a three hertz spike wave complexes in a patient with childhood absence epilepsy. You can see that in other primary generalized epilepsies, but this would indicate that this patient most likely has typical absence seizures. This could be a patient with JME, for example, but he probably, he or she probably has typical absence seizure. That is a primary generalized epilepsy. This is a similar epilepsy, but you can see here that it's a little bit slower. This is 2.5 to 3 hertz. If the background is normal, and it seems to be, here is the alpha rhythm, this patient also has a primary generalized epilepsy. This may be an adult, for example. So in childhood, it looks nice and perfect like this. In an adult, this could be a 32-year-old with a primary generalized epilepsy. It's starting to look less monomorphic and less perfect, but this is still basically diagnostic of a primary generalized epilepsy. By the way, the correct term these days is genetic generalized epilepsy. This is a patient with a focal epilepsy with sharp waves in the right occipital region. You see them here. Now, there are normal variants that are occipital, like post and lambda waves, but this is neither. These are negative at O2, whereas lambda waves and post, that's the P, are positive. These are definite occipital sharp waves, right occipital sharp wave with a patient with probably right occipital seizures. Here's a typical patient with temporal lobe epilepsy. You see a huge sharp wave, a maximum at T3 as evidenced by a phase reversal on a bipolar montage. Incidentally, this patient also has slowing in the same area. So this is a patient almost certainly with left temporal lobe seizures. You will notice here normal vertex waves and normal spindles. So he's in normal stage two sleep. And these are dramatic sharp waves. These are, or this is a generalized polyspike. So this is probably a patient with a primary generalized epilepsy and myoclonic seizures. Generalized polyspikes are the, are the EEG correlate of myoclonic seizures, just like three hertz spike wave complexes are the clinical correlate of typical absence seizures. This could be a patient with JME, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, but you need more information than the EEG to make that diagnosis. Uh, this is, these are different time samples. Bioserenity probably recognizes this sample. Um, these are spike detections, and this is a child with low amplitude stereotyped sharp waves in the left frontocentral or central temporal region, and in the proper clinical context of an eight year old who is of normal development and normal intelligence. This is highly suggestive of benign epilepsy with central temporal spikes or BECTS, B-E-C-T-S, or Rolandic, benign Rolandic epilepsy. The EEG is strongly suggestive, but of course you need the history and the global picture to make the diagnosis of epilepsy type. This is the same sharp wave in a referential montage to show a couple of subtle things. So this is, you see the sharp wave right here, this one. This is a bipolar double banana. Here is a referential, and this is meant to show that these sharp waves often have a weird morphology with a dipole where you have a neg negativity at T5, which is why this is going up, and a positivity in the front, which is why this is going down and this is going down. So there is a dipole with negativity in the temporal region and a positivity in the frontal area. That's another way to identify these sharp waves as strongly suggestive of benign Rolandic epilepsy. 
This is a very unusual sharp waves. By the way, if this were live, I would be quizzing, but we can't do it here and I don't see the chat, but uh, Janice will tell me later what questions are in the chat. This is a sharp wave, a left temporal sharp wave. It stands out, it disrupts the background, it's high amplitude, it's sharp. The unusual part of it is the polarity. You see the same thing here. It's positive at T3. Most epileptic sharp waves, 99.5% are negative. Essentially, the only time that you see positive epileptic sharp waves like this is when the patient has had some sort of surgery, which was the case in this patient. Here's another example of typical temporal lobe sharp waves. These are huge, broad, high amplitude, disrupt the background with an aftergoing slow wave, which is how we differentiate them from benign normal variants. And as you all know, the overreading of benign variants in EEG results in many, many wrong diagnoses of epilepsy, but these are definite sharp waves, no question. Left temporal, the max, or right temporal, excuse me. This is maximum at F8, this is maximum at F8, almost isopotential, so F8, T4, about equal. Here's another example of the same. These are unquestionable sharp wave with an EEG like this. The chances are, without knowing anything about the patient or their history, chances are greater than 90% that this patient does have epilepsy, left temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, so this is a typical bipolar longitudinal, otherwise known as double banana. Here is another one. And here you see that the, this is also left, right, left, right, double banana. You can see there is no phase reversal here, which means it's maximum at the end of the chain. So this is more of a frontal sharp wave right here at FP1 right here at FP1 and here at T1. So it would be FP1 followed by T1. This is a frontotemporal sharp wave, a little more anterior than typical temporal lobe epilepsy. And if you put it on a referential right here with an average reference, now we go by amplitude, not phase reversal to localize the maximum. And you can see the maximum is at FP1. So this is most likely a patient with frontal lobe epilepsy. But of course, to say that you need more, including recording seizures. This is a very common pattern. You can see the first half of the page and the second half look completely different. This is suppressed and it starts with this high amplitude polyspike or generalized paroxysmal fast. This is called generalized paroxysmal fast and this is called an, elect an electro decrement or an attenuation, very abrupt. This is typically seen with patients with generalized epilepsies of the lennox gasto type. And during this, the patient may indeed be having a brief tonic seizure. But many times this is asymptomatic, could be either. It's either asymptomatic, in which case it's an interictal abnormality, or it goes along with a tonic uh, stiffening, axial tonic stiffening, typical tonic seizures that these children or adults can have. And they also have this known as slow spike wave complexes. So these are repetitive generalized spike wave complexes at a frequency of less than 2.5 hertz. This is about one hertz, if that. Typically, as you know, these patients with lennox gasto types of epilepsy are not normal intellectually and neurologically. They have various degrees of intellectual disability, motor dysfunction, otherwise known as cerebral palsy, and very often intractable epilepsy. This is another example. This would be a similar type of epilepsy than this, and this is another high amplitude slow spike wave complexes. These are about two hertz maybe. Uh, lennox gastos typically less than 2.5 hertz. Primary generalized epilepsies are typically greater than 2.5 hertz. And of course, patients with lennox gasto like this tend to have other abnormalities like the generalized paroxysmal fast I showed you, or multifocal spikes and sharp waves, and very often abnormally slow background, which goes along with the fact that they are not neurologically and intellectually normal. This is another example of the same. Patient, this is symptomatic, that this is a seizure, basically it's an ictal pattern. On video, the patient has an abrupt jerk. You have this very dramatic generalized paroxysmal fast followed by flattening or attenuation or electro decrement. Same thing, and this is likely interictal, but it says tonic here. So most likely the patient had a brief tonic seizure. Again, this is a generalized paroxysmal fast. This is very, very typical of the generalized epilepsy of the Lennox-Gastaut type. You really don't see that in any other type of epilepsy. 
This is a pattern of very high amplitude. I call your attention to the scale. This is 1400 microvolts. This is 400 microvolts. So these things are huge, basically a thousand microvolts or greater than 500 anyway. Chaotic, disorganized with multifocal spikes, as you can see. And this is the very definition of hypsarrhythmia, which is a severe encephalopathic epilepsy in the first year of life, which typically evolves into other uh, electroclinical patterns later in life. This is another example of a positive uh, epileptic sharp waves, as I showed earlier. You see a positive phase reversal here. So that's most likely a patient with right temporal lobe epilepsy who had some sort of procedure or surgical ablation. Uh, this is what we occasionally see on routine EEGs, but much more often in ICU continuous EEG. So this is obviously a very abnormal EEG with a very um, rhythmic pattern that is fast, greater than 2.5 hertz, about three hertz. And this is very, very concerning for status epilepticus because of the rhythmicity and the frequency of three hertz. This is another example. So this is what you find in a patient in the ICU who is in non-convulsive status epilepticus. This is not the same because these are periodic, not rhythmic, but periodic. In other words, there is air between the discharges. These are at about one hertz. So where I was trained, we called these a periodic pattern. Now in the ACNS terminology, these are called generalized periodic discharges, GPDs or GPEDs. When GPEDs are less, are slow, less than 2.5, let's say, one hertz like here, it is not impossible that this is status epilepticus, but it is not highly likely, and this is much more likely to be a metabolic systemic encephalopathy. This is fast and rhythmic, and this is most likely ictal, i.e. status epilepticus. Whereas this, if you look at the time base here of three seconds, you have burst of activity for about two seconds and then a suppression, burst and suppression. This is called burst suppression and can either be spontaneous in which case it's very bad and poor prognosis or more often it is drug induced for various reasons, either ICP management or treatment of status epilepticus. So let me say a few words on my, my favorite topic of the overreading of EEG, which often results in wrong diagnoses of epilepsy. These articles discuss that in great details but I'll make the point that in any epilepsy practice, what we see are benign EEGs like this mistaken for this. So this is normal. These are wicked spikes. These are benign transients, whereas these are epileptic sharp waves in a patient with temporal lobe epilepsy. And the reason there is a lot of overreading is because of the misconception about phase reversal. This is discussed in both of these articles, if you would like them. But the bottom line is that phase reversals are not indicative of abnormalities. They never have been. It's a, it's a very common misunderstanding in EEG. Phase reversals are only indicative of location and specifically negative phase reversals like this, like this, or in benign variants like this, are only indicative of location. So what this tells you here is the maximum is at T3, T1. What this tells you is that this is maximum at F7 or T3. It doesn't tell you what the discharge is. It tells you where the discharge, the discharge is. Two of my clever residents uh, made the paper with clever titles that discusses again and shows example of phase reversals that are not indicative of any abnormality or any epilepsy. This is one cute title. I didn't come up with any of those, they did. Phasing out the fallacy of phase reversals and phasing out, this is the same one. And there is another one, um, which I forget what it's called, but there were two of them. And again, I can send you that. And with examples showing that phase reversals can occur in all kinds of things, normal rhythms, artifacts even, alpha rhythm, sleep spindles, vertex waves can have phase reversals. And that does not mean that they are abnormal or epileptic form. Here's an example of a vertex wave, for example. Okay, so let me move on to the second part of this, uh, which is what I really wanted to talk about, which is the other types of EEGs. This is all basically based on interictal EEG. So first of all, the value of doing prolonged EEGs, more than 20 minutes, hours, days, is to capture ictal patterns. I showed you a couple of them. 
like this, for example. So this is an ictal recording of a right frontal seizure. Remember, focal seizures mean something is rhythmic and has an evolution. So here you see rhythmic sharp waves, page one, page two, and you see that it evolves in frequency and distribution, page three. Now the frequency is different. That is a focal seizure. This you will only get on a prolonged EEG. It's very unlikely that you get this on a routine EEG. It does happen, of course, but it's pure random and luck. If you want to record seizures on an EEG, you have to do more than a routine. You have to do prolonged, typically a few days. Here's another example. So this one was a one, was a right frontal seizure. Here's a right temporal seizure, but you see the same rules, rhythmic discharge with an evolution in frequency, distribution, morphology, etc. This is the same generalized paroxysmal fast with a tonic seizure that I showed you on routine EEG interictally. When you capture a tonic seizures, this is what you see. And of course, the beauty of long EEG is my favorite as an epileptologist, which is video, EEG and video together. That's the most that I can do to characterize epilepsy patients. Uh, in the past, and I'm showing this article just as an example, that the wording ambulatory EEG usually implies no video, but that's because this is old fashioned thinking. Nowadays, every ambulatory EEG machine, every EEG machine indeed has a video. And we most of the time in the proper indication, which I will show you, should perform ambulatory EEG with video. Let me show you the value of a video. Is this a seizure? For me, as an epileptologist, EEG video monitoring, I like to say, is like the skin biopsy for the dermatologist. This is where I learn everything about this patient. This is a typical tonic-clonic seizure of a patient with a primary generalized epilepsy. Here's another one. Nothing replaces this. Nothing replaces the video. This is a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, but it's a focal seizure with secondary generalization. Of course, to say that I need the EEG, but even clinically you can suspect that. And this is not epilepsy. This of course is the most common differential diagnosis of epilepsy. These are episodes that are psychogenic, impossible to diagnose without the video. You need both video and EEG for this. And in fact, if you ask me if I have to pick one, do I want the EEG or do I want the video? I, and I believe most of my colleague epileptologists would say the video, assuming it's a good quality video. So there are many features of this. We've published this many times of the features of psychogenic episodes and why they don't look like epileptic seizures. Asynchrony between the two sides, high, side to side head shaking, stop and go, bicycling. You saw the first lady, uh, going from supine to prone, asynchronous shaking, flapping, flailing, those are the words we use when we describe, back arching, eyes closed. Pelvic thrusting like this, and back arching, very, very typical for psychogenic episodes. Change in rhythm. Slower, faster, changes direction. This is more pelvic thrusting and back arching. And you can see that this can be very dramatic. There is no way to diagnose psychogenic attacks without video. This is a typical temporal lobe seizure. As you can see, he presses the alarm because he has an aura, and then he will have those repetitive mouth and hand movements that we call automatisms. They're unnatural, repetitive, stereotyped, and purposeless. Repetitive and purposeless, that's what automatisms are. This is a typical temporal lobe seizure, and with that plus the EEG that shows the right temporal seizure, we are all set. These are not seizures and you need the video to diagnose them. These are benign ticks, but the kid was sent because of possible seizures. These are not ticks. This is focal motor seizures of the face, otherwise known as epilepsy a partialis continua. The important part about this 
is oftentimes focal motor seizures like this do not show up on the EEG even during this. So the video in this case is more important than the EEG, more important. The EEG is likely about 50% chance at least of showing nothing. So the video is everything. Remember I mentioned tonic and atonic seizures in anox gasto, so this is what they look like clinically. Very abrupt, and this is where you would see that electro decrement, that attenuation. And this is a home video. Those are incredibly helpful, just to illustrate the power of the video. This is a cell phone video sent by the mom. I don't need any EEG to tell me this is an epileptic seizure. The videos are very, very powerful. And to this point, my friend uh, Bill Tatum, with a bunch of us, published this article recently about the value of cell phone videos. And we have another one in the works that we presented at the AES in 2019. Uh, and let me just tell you, it confirmed, as you can see, what I suspected. This is a small N of about 20 patients, but 100% of the time, the diagnosis we made by looking at the cell phone video agreed with the eventual diagnosis in the epilepsy monitoring unit. So let's go over the, the various types of EEGs. The old fashioned EEG, routine EEG is cheap, brief, usually without video. And the purpose of this is to show you interictal epileptiform discharges. If a patient has an episode, the EEG shows definite sharp waves like I showed you, that's enough. For many patients, that's enough to make a diagnosis of epilepsy at least. We know that the yield of a routine EEG, single routine EEG for epilepsy starts low. At the first EEG, it's about 30%, 40%, 50%. The more you repeat it, the more chances you have to capture interictal epileptiform discharges. But sometimes it's pers persistently normal. So then you can do prolonged EEGs, right? If your goal is to capture interictal discharges, you don't need video. If the patient had one episode only three months ago, you're not going to capture an episode on an EEG now. So you can do prolonged with the intent of capturing interictal discharges. There's no video needed here from my point of view. That's basically using continuous EEG as an extended routine EEG. And since an EEG is about 20 to 30 minutes, a 24 hour continuous EEG is roughly equivalent to 50 routine EEGs. So it's much better than doing this. If you do a prolonged EEG with video, it's because your intent should be to capture an event. That's when you need the video. And of course, the longer, the better. So the purpose of the video on an EEG is to capture an episode. Again, if the patient had one episode, last one, eight months ago, you are not going to get one realistically by doing three days of EEG. Let's be real. Every EEG machine has a video, so it doesn't cost anything to put it on. But for me as the interpreter, I don't need the video of watching the patient go about his business eating pizza and watching a movie. I need a spell. I need the episode in question. And when that's the case, as I showed you, the video is critical and in some situations more important than the EEG. What about inpatient versus ambulatory? So this is a new dilemma because like for a long time, as I said, EEG video meant inpatient. It doesn't anymore. That's old fashioned thinking. It can be done outpatient. For me, as an epileptologist, I want the episode and I want the simultaneous EEG and the video. It doesn't matter if that's happening in the hospital or at home. So this is a comparative analysis, which I have in those papers I showed you, of inpatient versus outpatient. And outpatient ambulatory has some advantages. So the inpatient, of course, the biggest advantage is we can reduce the meds because the patient has an IV. And it's a controlled environment. The disadvantage is that it's an artificial environment. Patients are relaxed, laying in bed, getting breakfast, lunch, and dinner, like in a spa. So it's also inconvenience to admit people. And in a time like this with a pandemic, people aren't exactly crazy about coming to the hospital. Ambulatory has the advantages that it's the regular patient's environment where they have their episodes. They're in the comfort of their home. It's much lower cost and there is little of, or no wait time. EMUs oftentimes have a backlog of weeks to months. So the outpatient ambulatory EEG can allow the patients to get some type of evaluation quickly. The disadvantages are that we cannot decrease the meds safely and that sometimes the patients are off camera 
but this also happens in an EMU sometimes. And then bad electrodes need to be addressed quickly and the companies have made progress with that. So this is a summary of the pros and cons of each. There is absolutely a role for both. We are a surgical center here. We do 50 surgeries a year. We have seven beds of inpatient EEG video and we still find room to use ambulatory studies. There is a role for ambulatory studies. This is a table based on the same paper that uh, describes the pros and cons again. This is one study of ambulatory EEG by my friend Tanvir Syed, who was in Cleveland at the time. And the gist of it was, like I just said, that very often ambulatory EEG video gives an answer. And for non-urgent diagnostic evaluation, especially when your epilepsy center has a wait period of weeks to months, this is something that can really fill a gap. This is our own study, which will be published soon. Uh, we just finished it. It was just accepted in this journal. And so we should see it published in the next few months. And the gist of it, it's smaller than the Syed study, but it, the gist of it again is that the yield is excellent. You get the patients on camera with good EEG and good video, and it really helps you with the diagnosis. Just a closing note about the uh, codes. As you all know, the codes changed this year in 2020. I happen to think the newer codes are better. They pay less, so we don't like them for that reason. Um, but they, are, they make more sense than the old ones. The codes for EEG video depend, or for EEG, I should say, prolonged EEG depend on three things, duration, whether or not there is video, and whether or not the physician generates a daily report. And with that, you have all these combination of codes. The intent of this was to separate inpatient versus ambulatory, but as you can see, it doesn't say that anywhere. The intent is that with daily reports, 99% of the time will be inpatient because that's where we are in the hospital. We can generate daily reports. Whereas ambulatory studies, 99% of the time will be without daily report by the physician. That's not entirely true. There is a way to do a daily report if we deem it appropriate for ambulatory studies. I personally don't think it's ever necessary and I'm not doing it, but if people want to do it, it's absolutely okay. These codes, do not say inpatient versus outpatient. They say daily report or no daily report. Here are some examples of situations where ambulatory is just as good as inpatient. For example, a patient who has multiple daily events, multiple, 20 events a day. I don't need to reduce meds to see them. Can be done at home, as long as they make sure to be on camera. Patient with subjecting events only. Let's say the patient has deja vu and gets dizzy. Purely subjective. You don't need a video. As long as I get the EEG during the episode and the patient presses the alarm or the family, that's good enough. I don't need video. Another good example, when the episodes are nocturnal or in bed or in sleep, then there is a good chance the patient will be on camera and home may be just as good as inpatient. What about when it's ambulatory it might be even preferred? Some patients have their episodes only triggered by certain activities, exercising, driving, and when they come to the hospital, they're laying in bed all day, nothing happens. The patients who don't like to be in the hospital, including now with the pandemic, behavioral issues, children or intellectually disabled patients don't tolerate the constraints of being in a hospital room. Sometimes insurance doesn't cover inpatient, although more often than not, it's the reverse. They don't cover outpatient, they cover inpatient. Don't ask why. We use uh, ambulatory EEG video sometimes after an inconclusive inpatient study where nothing happened, because again, in the typical environment, it might be more likely. And, and of course, like we said, long wait for the EMU or very remote rural areas where there is no EMU nearby, you have to make use of ambulatory EEG video. So to close, hopefully I didn't go too long, I never do, no. EEG is critical for me as an epileptologist. EEG video is like is for me like the skin biopsy for the dermatologist. That's where I see everything about my patient seizures. Good EEG, good video. It doesn't matter where it's acquired. Home, hospital, office, bathroom, doesn't matter. Give me a good video, give me a good EEG, and I'm good to go. The video is critical. It's not a bonus, it's not an add-on. The test is called EEG video because it has two parts, EEG and video. And in certain situations, I showed you a couple of examples, 
video is even more important than EEG. But ideally, we want to have both. And ambulatory EEG video with that can be just as good as inpatient uh, EEG video monitoring. Thank you very much. I think that is it. And I am happy to answer questions. I will show my email address one more time in case people are interested in some of these articles. Are you still seeing my screen? Yes. You're on mute, Janice. But are there any questions? <laughs> I can't see the chat, so you're going to have to give me the questions. Sure. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, I can. OK, great. Um, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bemides. That was really a dynamic lecture, and I love the, the video. Um, I'll ask Dr. Lavin to uh, rejoin us. We, have, we do have a couple of, uh, of questions. Um, the first one is for Dr. Bemides. What percentage of patients uh, would you estimate are misdiagnosed as either having false positive seizures or false negative? So the, the main scenario at epilepsy centers is false positive. They come with a diagnosis of epilepsy. The general statistics, which is solid, replicated in all age groups, children, adolescents, adults, and even the elderly, is that 30% of patients who come to an epilepsy center with intractable seizures, 30% do not have seizures. And that's where EEG video has a big role. The reverse happens, but it's much more rare. Patient who was labeled as psychogenic or other things, and we who surprise excuse me, find that it is epilepsy. So that happens, but it's 20 to one versus the other way. Good to know. The second question goes to Dr. Lavin. Are there any neurological symptoms that, lo that last long after COVID recovery? Well, that's a, a, actually a very good question. And the, the answer is, at least from the information that we're, we're seeing now, uh, yes. Um, there are many, many cases, and, I, and unfortunately, it's, it's more the, uh, um, the rule as opposed to the exception. Uh, patients are presenting with continued uh, confusional state, uh, memory deficits, uh, and um, uh, difficulty in arousability, um, uh, sleep disorder, uh, narcolepsy. Uh, and uh, generally daytime sleepiness. And this is uh, many, many weeks to months uh, after the patients have been identified as being COVID negative. So it would seem to indicate that there probably is some focal injury uh, that has occurred that's persisting. Okay. And the last question uh, goes to Dr. Benvides. What percentage of epilepsy patients require surgical resection or intervention? Uh, there's a difference between what, what percentage require and what percentage get, the, get it. The, the, there's a big disconnect between the two. But let's just say epilepsy is 1% of the population. About 30% are medically refractory of those. Of a small proportion. The answer is a small proportion. Overall, it's about 10% that should be getting resective surgery. It's in the reality, it's not that high because patients take forever to consider the possibility of surgery. It's not in the culture, but it's a relatively small proportion, but it's a proportion that matters a lot because we can really change their lives. Okay. Well, thank you both. Uh, on behalf of BioSerenity Smart Healthcare Solutions, I want to thank our guest speakers. I also want to thank our attendees for uh, joining us today. Be on the lookout for uh, upcoming webinars. Uh, the next one will be in August. We will be releasing that date shortly. And I thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Have a great thank evening. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Dr. Bembides. Thank you all. Enjoy it. Bye-bye.